Welcome to Hub City Vineyard Church Online. If this is your first time, welcome. If this is not your first time, welcome back. If at any point during this service, you feel called by the Holy Spirit to make a change in your life, simply text change me to 97000 and someone from our church staff will reach out this week. And to find out more about our community of faith, check us out online at hcv.church. Outside your faithfulness, your love runs wild for me. There is no high, no death, and no space in between. There is no place, it's too far where you cannot reach. Thank you, Lord.
that your love will not see There's no border to cross that is outside your faithfulness Your love, it runs wild for me Yes it does, yes it does Hey, good morning everyone! Good to see you. If you're inviting us and joining us online, thank you for welcoming us into your space. So I just want to open in prayer this morning. As I was praying about uh, this talk this week, I really felt like God downloaded something special for all of us that was going to send us on a trajectory, not only to close out this series, not just for this one Sunday, but there was going to be something that just is implanted into our community of faith that will continue on for weeks and months to come. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to be here, God. We just give this entire time to you. We just thank you for your just presence that was so evident in our time of worship. And God, I just pray that you would use my words. They wouldn't be my words, they would be yours. And that God, you would just transform lives this morning. We're just thankful for the opportunity to gather and to celebrate your name. In Jesus' name, amen. So as many of you know, this is the last week of our Grace Bomb series. We've been discussing simply being kind to others and challenging ourselves to look outward for the whole month of July. And I've been sharing testimonies uh, about ones that I receive. I got this email just this week. Last week, I drove my mom and her husband to Baltimore to have testing done. We were in Baltimore for several hours. When we returned to Hagerstown, we were extremely hungry from not eating all day. And as we pulled into the restaurant of their choice, we ordered our meals. As the server brought the check to our table, I handed her my credit card and insisted she settle the check quickly. I then pulled out two Grace Bomb cards and blessed my mom and her husband with a free meal. Now, my mother's husband had had already placed a $100 bill on the corner of the table for the server to take to settle the check. When I told them that what Grace Bomb meant, they were so gracious. Get this. My mom's husband immediately got up from the table, took his Grace Bomb card, and blessed the table sitting across from us. He said, I just paid for your meal, and you have been Grace bombed. So you can see this wonderful act of kindness had a trigger effect. It ex- I explained to the table exactly what grace bomb meant. And from this kind act, the three people sitting at the table had many questions about our community of faith and praised God for what we were doing in the community. They were forever grateful, not to mention the people that were seated around them got to witness this as well. It was the happiest dining room I've been in for a while right? Amen, right? That's like giving back. Like he receives a grace bomb and immediately he gives it out. It's just incredible. So I want to encourage you, this series isn't going to end. It's going to continue to grow as we just listen to God's uh, command, listen to his challenge that we step out. Now, Martin Luther, a great theologian, wrote this in his articles entitled, Paul's Epistle to the Galatians. The gospel is the principal article of all Christian doctrine. Most necessary is we know this doctrine well, teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continually. Why would Martin Luther write this? I mean, that's a little harsh. Beat it into their heads continually. Well, the answer is pretty simple because we forget, right? We forget. We gather on Sundays, maybe we gather in our grace bomb groups, we receive the good news, the greatest news ever shared, then we just kind of go through our weeks. We just kind of walk and move through our lives. And there's those days where suddenly we find ourselves depressed, comparing ourselves to others, judging, fearful, walking through the religious motions. See, Martin Luther came to the simple conclusion that this is it. We have to continually beat into our heads the good news. See, Luther understood this. He's one of the greatest church leaders in modern history. He struggled with his own identity. He struggled with who he was in God and who God even was. And he lived in this wrestling match throughout his life. And he came to the conclusion that the gospel, the good news changes everything. Here's the reality, friends. News 
especially good news, is better than advice. I mean, how many of you like to really receive advice? Right, you know that person that just kind of is from the outside looking in and, oh, well, let, let me just see how you're doing in your life. Maybe I can give you a few pointers to make your life a little better. Look, I don't need good advice that may or may not work because quite often advice fails. I need news and I need good news. I, I don't need someone to tell me how to do it better. I need someone namely Jesus, to do it for me so I can simply follow the lead. Right? News is different than advice. We can all receive advice from Dr. Phil, Oprah. Right? We can read advice on social media. We can watch advice on YouTube or TikTok. I mean, heck, we even get our advice from the likes we receive on Facebook. Right? There's all kinds of good advice in the digital world. Good news is different. The good news has already been done for us. Jesus gave us good news to believe. And friends, that changes everything. I'm just like many of you gathered here today. I'm a go-getter. I want to change the world. I want to follow Jesus' ways. I want to drop grace bombs on our community. But all too often I fail. I blow it. I don't succeed in following Jesus' simple commandments. Right? Simple commandments. Have you, have you ever thought to yourself, Jesus said, love God, love others. He even challenged us. He says, forgive or you won't be forgiven. But have, have you ever had a bad day where you're just like, I'm not forgiving you. Like, forgive your neighbors. Nah, I'm not ready. Simple commandments. Right? That we just fail, that we screw up. Like, for example, many of you, how many of you, or many of you, sped to get here five minutes late? Right? Sped. I got to get there. Got to get there. Don't want to miss worship. Got to get there. You're going like 60, and then all of a sudden you cut someone off. Then you yell at them for being in the way. <laughs> See, we're all in this together. We're all just sinners saved by grace. Join us and grow. And see, what we're going to focus on this morning is it's not about us, it's about Him. And see, when we receive the good news, when we truly find out what Jesus did for us, who God is, and we, and we put that identity on ourselves, then suddenly we become who we truly are. We have to know who he is and what he has done in order for us to walk out this thing called following Jesus, to have this relationship with him naturally. In fact, the text that we'll be going through today, the book of Ephesians, is broken up this way. The first three chapters are all about what Jesus has done what God has done, what Jesus and God has done for us. Then in chapters four, five, and six, Paul says, well, now that you know that, now that you understand your identity, assuming you do, you can grow in loving your wife or loving your husband, being a teen, being a kid, being an employer, being an employee, being a follower of Jesus, being in a government, being in the community, and all the things that Ephesians chapters four, five, and six tell us to do. But see, Paul doesn't tell us to do anything until what? Until he drives home in the first three chapters what God has done for us. How many of you right now, just by a show of hands, humor me, would say, you know, Chris, I don't know everything. Okay, a majority of you, the rest of you are lying. (laughs) Don't worry, there's prayer for you at the end over here on the side, okay? We'll pray for you, too. Play with me along, you know, play along with me here for a second. I don't know about you, but there's certainly days in the week where I feel like I know everything. I know it's best for them. At least that's the way I act with my spouse and my kids, my coworkers, friends at Hub City. You know, let's just do another question. How many of you act like you know what you're doing? Now, everybody's hands should be up for that, right? Everybody acts like they know what they're doing. I mean, my hand's not up to try to get you to raise your hand. Okay, I'm 49 years old, and for the last 27 years, I've been in a relationship with Jesus, and God has been challenging me with this simple reminder. I don't know everything. Nor will I ever know everything, so therefore don't act like you know everything. And here's the truth, friends. When we realize this, when we realize that we don't know it all, that we don't have it all together, that there's so much more to learn and experience right here, right now, and every day. 
that just the simple fact that God wants us to be more like Jesus, when we take on that position, that attitude, both mentally and spiritually, then following Jesus becomes fun again. Worship becomes fun again. Prayer is fun again. Giving is fun again. Taking communion becomes fun again. Serving others is fun again. When we humble ourselves and realize we don't know it all. We don't have it all together. And trust that God has more. That's where God wants us to be. I remember I was thinking back this week to my first home Jess and I ever purchased. It actually wasn't a home. It was a condo. It was a brand new condo. It was beautiful. And we bought this new place. Now remember, just built. And and there was this one electrical outlet that when you plug something into it, it didn't work. The vacuum wouldn't come on, right? The light wouldn't come on. And then remember, this is a new place, just built. We just moved in. Then not only was there a plug, there was an outlet. I mean, a, a, a switch that didn't work as well. It's like we flipped this switch. Nothing would come on. So we went to my father-in-law who happened to build it. So when your father-in-law is a builder, you can complain a lot, right? <laughs> said, look, man, we just bought this place. It's expensive, brand new stuff. He goes, hey, plug the vacuum in. Plug the vacuum in. He flipped the switch. Vacuum came on. <laughs> oh, when you plug in and flip the switch, it changes everything. Now, some of you just re- received some good home improvement advice. <laughs> you're welcome. We get real deep here at Up City. If you're visiting us, we just get real deep, challenge you to grow. But see, it's a great example because there's so many people that are in a relationship with Jesus. Hear me out. Listen. They're walking around with the riches of God inside of them, you know, the Holy Spirit, but they haven't connected the two together. This is life changing. This will change your life. We experience abundant life when the two are on, right? We can, it, it, it's not about checking off all the religious boxes. Go to church, read my devotional, read my Bible, pray five times every day. All good things, right? Plugging the vacuum in to the broken outlet. It's when the switch gets flipped that all of it works together. We have got to be connected to the source. The source leads to abundance, which leads us to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is absolutely amazing. It's been called the queen of the epistles, the quintessential writing of Paulinism, the the divineness composition of man. It's been called the Waterloo of commentaries. It's been said that when one reads this book, you've got to get excited. Can you tell? (laughs) Let me just say this. If you're in a relationship with Jesus here this morning, and you've been in said relationship for more than six months, there's a really good chance that you're a little crusty, okay? Especially around the edges. And I want to challenge you to return to this book. I want to challenge you to to plug in and flip the switch, and that as you read this book, this letter, if you will, you will be reinvigorated. So Paul, he was writing this letter to the church in Ephesus from a prison cell. Okay, so, so picture Paul, right? Greatest church planner ever known in the history of the church in a prison cell. He's, he's in jail writing a letter. We find him oozing. I want to say oozing. And not a cool word. Oozing with love, with desire for his church. This church that he started in Ephesus. And we can all relate to this church. We are all primarily Gentiles living in a very dark, carnal world. Ephesus, at the time of this writing, was the fourth largest city in the world. The Temple of Artemis, the Temple of Diana were there, all kinds of different religions, all kinds of commerce and trade. It was located right on the Aegean Sea, very wealthy city, constantly bubbling with excitement. The internet was created there. (laughs) Just kidding. What is... (laughs) Just wanted to see if you were paying attention. Some of you are like, really? <laughs> and I still don't know it? <laughs> wow. So we have this very large city in an urban center with people all around. And then we have this church. We have the church of Ephesus. And Paul is writing this letter, which leads to our first thought. See, a relationship with God is through Jesus. So, so back in Acts, we're going to go backwards a little bit. Back in Acts chapter 19, we read about Paul 
showing up in Ephesus. So Paul shows up, feet on the ground, and he meets this group of disciples that we're going to read about in verses 1 through 6. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? He asked them. Now I just want to pause there for a second, hit the pause button, leave the words up. This is kind of confrontational. Paul meets this group of disciples, right? He, he's listening to them. He's watching them. And there must have been something a little bit different about them. Maybe the way they talked. Maybe the way they lived their lives. Maybe they just smelled bad. I have no idea. But there was something different about them. And then he gets in their face. He's like, do you love Jesus? Like, are you really a disciple? Now, this event happened 20 years after Jesus rose from the grave and ascended. So Paul is thinking, they have to know about Jesus. Notice their response. Let's continue on. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Now, stay there, Paul. They were referring to John the baptizer. John the baptizer told his followers to repent, turn from their sin, and become religious. Paul, what does he do? He sees this as an opportunity to what? Share the rest of the story, share the good news. So Paul says this. John's baptism called for repentance from sin. John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. See, these disciples became the church in Ephesus, right? And Paul would stay there with them two and a half years, teaching them, pouring into them in the school of Tyrrhenius. Now, as we're looking at this group of people, these disciples, if you will, they were like the vacuum plugged into the broken switch. They didn't have the source turned on, right? They didn't have it turned on. So Paul is wanting so much more for this church, He desires for the church in Ephesus to grow and be abundant because he remembers how he found them, right? They had a tendency to get off course. They had a tendency to wander, to misconnect. We all can find ourselves in similar positions, right? We walk through this thing called life. It's challenging. It's difficult. It's hard. And this one picture of the church of Ephesus, Paul meets them. They didn't have it all together. They were missing something. They wanted more. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you just happened to wander in here because you want a little more. You want something different. You want to experience God in a new way. Let's look at another picture. Fast forward. Jesus, from heaven, translates a message to John, literally downloads the book of Revelation And in the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses seven different churches. One of those churches happened to be the church of Ephesus. We read this in Revelation 2, 2 through 4. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. Excuse me. You have examined the claims of those who said they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Pause. In other words... Church, you're doing great. You're doing incredible things. Multiple gatherings, baptisms, people reached, changing your community, learning center. Great job. Well done. Jesus is stoked, saying they're doing well. But, everyone say but. But. Say it again. You have lost something. Let's continue. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And Jesus is saying, church, you need to include me in everything. Church, come back to me and receive all the blessings from me. Return to your first love. You know that excitement when your relationship started? That excitement when you got baptized? That excitement. Return to me and experience that. Listen, I've been following Jesus for 27 years. And one thing I've learned in pastoring people is this. If we aren't careful, we can find ourselves going through the motions. 
We can find ourselves becoming religious, checking off boxes, forgetting what it's all about. Right? We can find ourselves simply going to church, smiling because we have to, standing and saying because that's eh, just what we do, raising my arms because well, everyone else is, I guess it's time. Could Jesus be inviting us back to him this morning? Could Jesus be inviting us back to his love, back to the simplicity of the gospel that set us free from striving, doing life on our own? See, when we get free of striving, then we live in abundance. So think about it. We have Paul writing this letter from prison to the church he loves. He's not even asking for help. Don't pray for me. Don't send money to me. No, he's sending encouragement to them that they don't fall away from Jesus. First thing I'm going to challenge you with today is this. Read the book of Ephesians this week. That's your homework. Right? Don't worry about social media. You're going to do social media anyway. Read the book of Ephesians this week and apply it to your life, which leads us to our next thought. Jesus is our source of strength and confidence. See, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 is the longest Greek sentence in the Bible, quite possibly in the world. See, now, in our Bible, it's broken into a period because of the translation. In the Greek, it's one sentence. It's one thought. Paul takes his deep breath and exhales an elaborate from a heaven to earth gift for all of us. And he says, this will change your life forever. If you turn on the switch and you're plugged into me. And he starts the letter this way in Ephesians 1, 1 through 3. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. I mean, think about what he just wrote there. God has given us access to every spiritual blessing. Could it be that those of us that are in a relationship with Jesus, you're gathered here this morning, are not walking in all that God has for us? There's more, friends. Humor me this morning. I want you to pray this simple prayer. Humor me. God, I want more. God, I want more. And, and see, this prayer, that prayer that you just prayed, is not a prayer of doing more. I'm not asking you to get up earlier. I'm not asking you to study. I'm not asking you to read more. I'm not asking you to memorize verses. I'm not asking you to pray more or give more. I'm wanting you to pray that prayer so we can simply trust in what he's already done. Which allows God's truth and love to flow through us and into others. When we go back to our first love. When we go back to that first encounter that we have with Jesus, the Holy Spirit literally wakens inside of us, which leads us to our next thought. Listen, Jesus' followers are in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, Paul writes this. United in Christ, in Christ, into his family through Jesus. Belong to his son, our freedom with the blood of his son. United with Christ, identified you as his own, purchased us to be his own people. Paul uses the term in Christ, in him, in the beloved, in God, in heaven, just under 30 times, just in this letter. It was exactly 29 times. Now throughout the letters that he wrote to the different churches... Paul would use these same phraseologies as in Christ, in God, 216 times through all 14 letters if we include the book of Hebrews. Let me ask you a question. If a person says the same thing 216 times to the same audience, do you think they're trying to make a point? Yeah. <laughs> I think so, right? If my wife said the same thing to me 216 times, eventually I'm going to say, hey, just write it down. Come on. Jeez. I mean, I believe Paul is trying to say to us, church, church, this is very important. Hey, church, in Christ, in Jesus, that's what it's all about. Right? When you wake up Wednesday 
And you find yourself saying, well, I don't have any joy. I'm not happy. I don't have the strength. I'm not going to make it. You know what Paul's going to say to you? Good. It's in Christ. It's in him. It's not about you. Another reason Paul says it so often is because we forget. I mean, we're people. We forget about the good news. We forget that the gospel is the hope for all mankind. And we forget it's been given to us. Right? We wake up in the morning, we're drained, we're tired, our body aches, we feel overwhelmed, unable to move forward. And friends, if we have that view of God, it's like we're looking at God like he's bankrupt. Like God's going bankrupt. Right? Newsflash, God's love never runs out. God's grace never stops. His forgiveness is continuous. God is never out of power. There's always joy in the Spirit. God is not bankrupt. God is not broke. God is not stingy. We are. We people are broke and stingy. Always feeling, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. God is not. But why is it that that if we're in a relationship with Jesus, why is it when we pray, when we read, when we make decisions, it's usually based on our resources. It's usually based on our abilities first. We don't rely on God. You know, just like I said earlier, well, I guess I could forgive my neighbors today. I'm in a good mood. (laughs) No, it's a continuous thing. The problem with depending on me first is that that God calls us to step out on the water, out of the boat. and, And he calls it even when it makes no sense. I mean, I love the story of Peter, right? I love this story of Peter walking on the water. And have you ever noticed, I was reading it this week, there's no good reason for Peter to walk on the water in the middle of a storm. I mean, the different accounts that record Jesus walking on the water, right? This is a major storm. The disciples are freaking out, fearful, worried that their boat was going to tip. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. Right? There's no good reason for Pete to get out of the boat and experience a miracle. No reason. Yet, Peter says this in Matthew 14. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Jesus, walking on the water. He's, what's up? <laughs> yes, come. Come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. Paul's there. Think about this. This is the only human being that has ever surfed without a surfboard. (laughs) Coolest thing ever. And then what's he do? He gets in his head. He starts relying on himself. And he begins to what? Trust himself and he sinks. Help! Help! Let's continue. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified. Began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus, now notice this, this is so cool. Jesus, the crossfitter, immediately reached out, grabs, and throws them in the boat. And you wonder why I work out. i got to be like Jesus. All right, Jesus, the crossfitter, he throws them in the boat. <laughs> you have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they said. Notice, remember, there was no good reason for Peter to get out of the boat. God was calling him out of the boat, right? Peter responded. There was no good reason. Was there a reason? Yes, there was a reason. The disciples believed. Once Peter got out and walked on the water and they saw Jesus walking on the water, the disciples believed by Peter taking a step of faith, even though it made no sense at the time, which oftentimes is what happens when God tells us to take a step of faith. God, this makes no sense. Good. Take it anyway. The disciples believed. I mean, I don't know about you. But I want to live with this same type of faith. I want to get out of the boat every time the Holy Spirit invites me to. Every time the Holy Spirit invites me to get out, I want to get out. And then if you're anything like me, you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you think, oh, it's not going to happen today. Ooh, what happened? But that's the wrong outlook. It's the wrong outlook. Look at the way Paul addresses his people. Another translation from the new King James Version, Ephesians 1.1, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. 
saints in Christ, faithful in Jesus. See, this is where the riches are. Paul, throughout the first 14 verses of Ephesians, continues to say this time and time and time again. Think about it. Paul is calling you a saint. Paul's, Paul's calling you a saint. How many of you stopped by Starbucks this week, and when, and when the barista asked you, could I have your name, please? He said, uh, St. Christopher with an S. How many of you did that? Anybody do that? St. Christopher with an S. Now, some of you, you're going to go to work tomorrow and be like, yo, I need a new name tag. I learned something at church yesterday. Okay, that would be St. Kathy. Okay? We don't feel like saints. Right? There's not a day that goes by that we don't feel like saints. Quite often, we feel like ain'ts. And see, here's the problem. Here's where we get in the way of ourselves. We act. We live our lives based on how we feel. I mean, if all of us did and acted on what we felt like doing, newsflash, you'd all be in jail. Right? Everyone nod. That's true. That's not false. All of us would be in jail. In jail. We can't act on our feelers. We can't. We have to live on what we know. We have to stand on who we are in Christ. See the difference? We stand on the good news. He calls us saints. He is not addressing us with a word to make us feel good. Saints means set apart. Saints means purified in Jesus. It means you are special through your relationship with him. Listen, you don't have to feel like a saint to be a saint. Okay, this group of believers in Ephesus, they're just like you and me. They were messed up. They needed to understand who they were in Christ. Think about Paul. Right? Here's this man. He's sitting in a prison cell thinking about what he's going to write to this letter to the church that he loves. Think about it. He's chained to the prison guard. He's, he's just sitting there in prison, chained to a prison guard. He's going to write this letter to his church, and suddenly it comes to him, I'm going to write about the blessings of God that come from Christ. I mean, I woke up in jail. It makes no sense. How does Paul do this? How does he have this drive to keep moving forward? Well, he told us in his letter to the Philippians. He says, look, I, whether it's a lot or a little, Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul does everything through Christ, in Christ, because he was in him and he was receiving every spiritual blessing. Can I be honest with you just a minute this morning? Do you mind if I'm just honest with you? Tuesday, I had a difficult morning. Okay, for those of you who don't know, uh, this coming Tuesday, August 2nd, is Jess and I's 25th wedding anniversary. Pretty cool, huh? 25 years! That's a long time, that's a quarter century. <laughs> right? 25 years! We've been together. We've been in love. It's happily ever after. Just lying. <laughs> That's not true. Anyway. Anyway. So 25, 25 years, our anniversaries this Tuesday, last Tuesday, happened to be online, right? Social media. Just don't do it. It's such a waste of time. Anyway. So online, I saw this other pastor friend of mine that I was friends with. Oh, his family's vacationing in Italy. He's in Greece. He's, you know, seeing the Parthenon and all the, you know, I'm just like, man, it's a bucket list. I guess one thing I wanted to do. And then I start beating myself up. Man, here I am. Going to be married 25 years. That's supposed to be a big do. And within our society, 25 years, oh, you take a big trip. You go on a cruise. You go to Greece and Rome. You go to Hawaii. You pamper your wife. You, you do this. You do that. And here I am. I'm such a loser. I didn't plan anything. Heck, we still don't know where we're going, and we're two days away. <laughs> so that's my Tuesday morning. I'm beating myself up. Loser. Can't even love your wife, right? I have no money. Jeez. It's such a waste. Then God whispers in my ear about 11 o'clock. May have been 11.05, I don't know. Maybe 11.12. He says, Chris, you and 
Jess. You've been selling out for the kingdom for 25 years. You've given your entire lives to my kingdom. What more do you want? Lives changed. People healed. Souls set free. Baptisms. Growing healthy church. Changing your community. Chris, remember, there's more to life than a trip. There's more to life than a vacation. Does it make sense? Yeah, it's good. But I just do want to throw out there, if any of you happen to have a condo that overlooks New York City with a hot tub, maybe rooftop, and you want to donate it to me on Tuesday, I, let me borrow it. I'd appreciate it because right now we're going to just hop on and kayak somewhere because we have nowhere to go. All right? So if you have any ideas, any thoughts, you know, want to give me a rooftop condo with a hot tub, just let me know. I'll, I'll take a break for a day. Okay. See, we have to remember that we, you and I, are spiritual beings living a short human experience. We are not human beings becoming more spiritual. That's what so many people think. Oh, I'm spiritual. Chris, I'm going to come to your church and become more spiritual. Wrong. We are a spirit having a very short human experience. However, our, spirit, our spirits will live on and on for eternity. Paul is reminding us this morning of how blessed we are. And see, these blessings are not so much the things God will give you. Money, restore relationships, freedom. Kids one day, if you want them, a job, a car. Good things from God. I believe God is a giver of good things. I believe that those things are good. I believe having a car is good. Having a spouse is good. Great things. But God is better than all those things combined. Did everyone hear that? God is better than all those things combined. You're like, Chris, how do you know that? Paul is in prison with none of those things. What's he doing? Rejoicing about God. Celebrating God. The blessings are in him. In Christ, that's where we find what we need. That's where we discover meaning in our lives. And what we need this morning is to realize who we are. So, six ways that we are in Christ. First, we are chosen. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Think about this. God was thinking about you and your relationship with him, even before the earth was formed, while you were in your mother's womb. That blows your mind. God acted so that you would be enabled to have faith and belief. You and I are chosen friends, and that's something to celebrate. Does God know everything? I believe he does, yes. He knows everything. And I know that God has begun a new work in you, if you're in a relationship with him, and what he creates is not ugly, stupid, or no good. Did everyone hear that? Think about the stars. Have you ever just paused? Look at the stars. I want to challenge you to do so this past Monday. It's a beautiful night. We took the top off the Jeep. Me and Jess, Phoenix, threw him in the car. <laughs> Needed a break. Throw him in the car. <laughs> he loves the Jeep. The kid's being spoiled. Top down. Right, my, all my other kids are just, he's got, he's got a Jeep, but he's two years old. Who cares? Calms him down. So we drive to the middle of nowhere, somewhere out in Clear Spring, and we look up. Have you ever just looked up the star when in a dark spot? You're just like, oh my gosh. Just stars everywhere. And, and, and you're sitting there looking at these stars, you're thinking, God, why so many? Why so many stars? You know the crazy thing is, Psalm 19 tells us why. Psalm 19 tells us that there's so many stars in the sky because it displays God's handiwork and his glory. Yet what do we do? Oh, well, scientists tell us that there's 900 billion light years worth of stars and on the edge of those stars there might be more stars, maybe a waterfall and you can take a bath and swim. And It's like, give me a break, man. God didn't create an edge because God is infinite. There's no edge, it's just stars. Now think about this. The God of the cosmos, right? The God that named the stars. I mean, think about it. He created the cosmos, spoke him into being. He's like, oh, they're twinkle, um, 
twinkle. Uh, see, he's smarter than me. <laughs> Names all the stars. He's just a lot more creative than me. He chose you and me. And we're thinking, really? Yeah, we're chosen. Which leads us to our next truth. We're adopted. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure, so he praised God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. When we begin a relationship with Jesus, we're born into God's family, and we have all the benefits of being his children. For example, you ready to play a game with me? Here we go. Imagine, go to that place, imagine being adopted by Elon Musk. For those of you that don't know him, that's the guy that owns Tesla and SpaceX. He's the richest man in the world. Okay. Imagine that. We'd be set for life when it comes to money. Somebody's like, yeah, endless bank account. Let's go to New York City. Let's buy some shoes. (laughs) Right? You're rich when it comes to material things. How much are you going to get spiritually, though? Think about it. Spiritually, we've been adopted by the creator of the universe. And God gives us standing in his family despite all our insignificance, all our mistakes, all of our sins. He says, my inheritance is yours. I'm going to give you every spiritual blessing. Which leads us to our next truth. We're redeemed. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered us his kindness Upon us, along with all wisdom and understanding. Redeemed carries the idea that we were bought with a price. We moved from slavery, in slavery, what? To freedom. Jesus paid the price. Jesus' death on the cross was for our sins, our mistakes. And Jesus, and God says, that's enough. Right? You're free. Forgiven means God removed all our guilt and shame. That our sins are literally carried away. That guilt and shame no longer have a place in you when you're what? In Christ. These are powerful truths. Which leads us to our next one, number four, we are wise. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Jesus died To unite all people. Everyone say all. All All people. No matter race, no matter gen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter economic. He he wants to relate all people. He wants to create a new family in Jesus. And see, we're wise when we see others as God sees them. We see others as God's chosen son, God's chosen daughter. Now, they may not be in a relationship with him yet, but quite possibly you're the reason that they're going to get in one. But it only happens when we're wise and we see that God wants all people to come in to relationship with him. Which leads us to our next truth. Number five, we are heirs. In Christ, we are heirs. Furthermore, we are united with Christ. We have received an inheritance, there it is, from God, for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. See, God's inheritance will never run out. It's eternal. It's forever. It's perfect and pure. The inheritance will never get old. God's inheritance only gets more beautiful and interesting and, and challenging day after day after day. Look at First Peter 1, 3 through 4. All praise to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance. There it is. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Listen to the same set of verses from the message paraphrase. What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master Jesus, because Jesus was raised from the dead. We've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us in the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole powerful which leads us to our final truth we are identified and now you gentiles ephesians 1 13 and 14 also heard the truth the good news that god saves you and when you believed in christ he identified there it is 
you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit of God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we could praise and glorify him. Identified or sealed, if you will. It speaks of an officially completed transaction. Like when we begin that relationship with Jesus, it's sealed. It's done. It can't be broken. Identified, look at this, in John 10, means this. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me and he's more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. See, once we're in Jesus, we're in Jesus, we're in Christ. Identified also means we bear fruit. Look at Galatians 5. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like when we're in Christ, that's what we gain. When our identity is in Jesus, we get those qualities. They come out of us. People see them. So what do we do with these truths? Those six truths I just listed are for you. You receive them and you rest in them so that we can become all that God desires. What does God desire? God desires that we become his ambassadors. We become Jesus ambassadors to our community, to a dark world. And how do we do this? Real simple. You ready? Take a risk. Take a risk. Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Now that adoption is very important. If we believe we have been adopted into the family of God, guess what? We now have the ear of the Father. Think about that. We have the ear of the Father. Now, in the Old Testament, when we read through the Old Testament, we don't see God as the Father. We don't see him as Father God. You know, God in the Old Testament is is actually a lot more like the Godfather, right? Is that okay if I said that? Sure. The Godfather. And Jesus comes on the scene. Everything changes. Same God. He's just now full of love and grace. And and Jesus says this, hey, church, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven. Wait a minute, Jesus. You mean I can address Father God as Abba, Father, as the Father? Yes. Jesus said when you approach God, approach him like a little kid. You know how a little kid speak to their father? Look, I've had six kids. They tell you what they want. I need this. I need that. Can I please have this? Can I please have that? I need this. I need that. He says this to us because he hears our voice, right? Again, I know my kid's voice. I have a two-year-old. When Phoenix screams, right, I know it's him. There's been a couple babies in here screaming. That's not Phoenix. I know it. If Phoenix was to scream, I'd be like, yep, that's him. Can you please get him in the family room? That leads me to a simple question. How often do you pray? I mean, we're told in the Bible to pray without ceasing. But quite often, Jesus followers say, oh, when I need to, when I need something, when I go around to it, God doesn't want to hear my prayers. He loves me. He's obligated to love me. After all, he is love. But he doesn't really like me. That's a lie. That's a lie. I want you to imagine the best father you could ever imagine on this earth. The best father, man, he's a good father. He's, he does this for his kids. He's always there for them. Times it by a billion, and that's how you would discover God's love for us. A billion. Now think about us parents. Us parents here on earth, good parents, if you will, we take pictures of our kids all the time, post them on Facebook, we write down their first words ever spoken, we have pieces of their hair from their first haircut. I mean, shoot, we even saved the first tooth that fell out of their head. I mean, seriously, we're gross. What are you going to do with a tooth that fell out of your kid's head? What are we going to do with that? Oh, it's in a drawer somewhere. Let me find it. When they get married, I'm going to put it in their hand and bless them. That's not your first tooth. Have you ever thought about that? Like, we're really weird. Aren't we, Roger? We're really, really weird. I mean, we're gross people, but yet we love our kids and we do that for them. 
but yet that's fractional compared to God's love. And see, when we believe that, it changes the way we pray. It changes the way we read the Bible. It is time to become the adopted sons and daughters that God wants us to be. Friends, he hears your prayers. And not only that, but secondly, when we become adopted sons and daughters, that means that we become a part of the family business. See, we're doing this together. God is looking at the church saying, welcome to the kingdom, now join the team. Let's do this. We're ambassadors of Jesus into our culture that's full of selfishness. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to me. I mean, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom, all the kingdom stuff. And then I'm sending you out to do the stuff. When God gave the keys to the kingdom, right, to one of his disciples, does anybody know who he gave it to? He gave it to some guy named Pete, Peter. Yep. He gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. And you think, wait a minute, if you know anything about Peter, you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I'm encouraging you to do so, you would realize that Peter, he has foot and mouth disease. He's constantly messing up. And, and on top of that, he was the most likely not to succeed. I mean, heck, as soon as Peter gets the keys of the kingdom, like Jesus is like, I'm going to build my church on you, right? A few verses later, you know what Jesus says to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. I don't know about you, but it's a bad day when Jesus calls you Satan. He hasn't called me Satan yet, but when he does, I'm like, that's a bad day. Whew. But see, Jesus didn't make a mistake. See this. He accounted for all of Peter's mistakes, and he knew Peter would take a risk. I mean, look at Matthew 14. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if truly you, remember, no good reason. I'm going to walk on water. No good reason. Yes, come, Jesus said, so Peter went. He does the same with us. He invites me. He says, Chris, will you take some risks? Will you tell someone about me? And then he says, here's the cool thing. When you tell someone about me, I do all the work. You don't have to do anything. Because it's, it's the Holy Spirit living in you that does all the work. It's kind of like bowling. Like when you go bowling, especially 10-pin bowling, you know with the big, big balls, you know those big things you roll, some of you have to do like a, right? <laughs> they have these things on the lanes that you can put the rails up. Like, you know what I mean? When we reach out and do something for God, it's like bowling with the rails up. You always get a pin. True or false? True. You always hit something. That's what... Reaching out and giving away the kingdom is like. And God is challenging us. Friends, be about my business. Because quite often what happens in Community of Faith, we do this series, we got a poster, a grace bomb, we got cards, right? All right, we're being kind for the month of July. Thank goodness in August I can go back to being a jerk. <laughs> no. We want this to continue. Right? We want you to invite your neighbors, your co-workers, to be baptized in the park. Right? August 21st, we're taking over Williamsport Park, food trucks, worship, and we're taking over the pool. We're gonna, but the most important thing about that pool is not the pool party. I mean, that's fun, but we want to baptize people in that pool. And that's what God is calling us to do. And, and there's people that you know in your sphere of influence that want to be baptized, and all it says is, hey, we're going to take over the park. Come be baptized. Really? I can be baptized? Sure. You want me to grace bomb my coworkers by bringing them a cup of coffee? Yes. You want me to give my shoes? I have a lot of shoes. To Souls for Souls in September. It's really cool. In September, we're bringing back Souls for Souls. We haven't done it in a couple of years because COVID shut down. Anyway, you just bring in all your shoes you haven't worn for a year, and you all have a bunch of them. And then we send them all around the world to kids that don't have shoes. Isn't that cool? It's making a difference. And I know what all of you are thinking, but Chris, if I step out in faith, I'm going to blow it. If I walk, try to walk on the water, I'm going to blow it. Good, I do too. Read the Bible. Everyone blows it. There was one person who was perfect, and his name was? Jesus. That was really bad, people. Come on. I mean, read. Read about the disciples. Read about Peter. They all mess it up. They all say the wrong thing. They all do the wrong thing. But God still used them. And you say, why? Why, Chris? Why take a risk? Two reasons. First, it brings God's pleasure. 
This is what God wanted you to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I mean, God is excited to include us in the work of the kingdom. Remember, he's not broke or stingy. He wants to use us. I mean, God called me to pastor a church in the middle of a square in Quito, Ecuador. I was speaking English. Everybody around me was, didn't even understand what I was saying. I had a translator. 25 people gave the life of Jesus that day. And God said, this is what you're called to do. This is what you're called to do. Right? And you say, what's that have to do with anything? That, I wasn't going to be a pastor. I didn't even want to be a pastor. I was going to teach kids, become an administrator, make the big bucks. Right? Right, Mike? Make the big bucks, man. But no, God calls me to pastor. Now I can't even take my wife on a 25th year anniversary trip to Greece. <laughs> Jeez. But here's the point. It takes God great pleasure when he uses us. Look at us now. It's like God uses us to change lives, but it, it gives him pleasure when we step out and finally it reveals God's grace. This is so great. So we praise God for the glorious grace when he is, that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. See, this all happens for one reason. When, when people see grace in our life, it brings praise back to God. This is the only reason. The reason we do grace bombs, the reason we do a card is what? It's not for us to buy coffee for someone. It's to point people back to Jesus. God uses us to change our community this way. There's a great example of this. In the book of Deuteronomy, okay, the book of Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. It's, it, it's the longest recorded sermon in the, in the Bible. So sit down for another hour. I'm going to read the whole thing to you. Okay, you guys ready? I'm just kidding. These words are spoken right before Moses leads the children into Israel into the promised land. Now remember, Moses doesn't even get to go to the promised land. He disqualified himself because he made God look mad. God says, Moses, I'm not angry. I'm a God full of love and grace. And Moses speaks these words in Deuteronomy 9, 3 through 6. Recognize today that the Lord your God is the one who will cross over ahead of you like a devouring fire to destroy them. He will subdue them so that you will quickly conquer them and drive them out just as the Lord has promised. After the Lord your God has done this for you, don't say in your hearts, the Lord has given us this land because we are such good people. No. It is because of the wickedness of the other nations that he's pushing them out of your way. It's not because you are so good or have such integrity that you're about to occupy their land. The Lord your God will drive these nations out ahead of you only because of their wickedness and to fulfill the oath he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You, church, must recognize that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land because you are good, for you are not. You are a stubborn people. And see, God is saying to us, I am choosing you, church, to go out into the world and be my light to a dark place. And he also says, I am choosing you, church, because you're stubborn, hard-headed, stiff-necked, no good people. And when the world sees that God can use even you, they'll look at you and say, no way! Kimmy, God uses you? No way! Are you serious? So the next time, the next time, actually today when you're walking out and there happened to be this guy named Chris Rudy Rudisell, make sure you look at him and be like, no way! God uses you to change lives? Gotcha. He's wearing his true or false shirt. For those of you who don't know, you can go back and listen to his talk. It wasn't very good, but anyway, he made fun of me. My point is this, get in the game, get in the game, okay, God is calling us to be a part of so much more, you know, I'm wearing this jersey this morning, and some of you are thinking, is that a grace bomb jersey, Chris, you're sold out, that's amazing, no, it's not, I'm a San Francisco Giants fan, okay, I'm a San Francisco Giants baseball fan, other end of the country, okay, and they're reading, but let me tell you a little story, okay, first some side note, my son, Nolan, had this jersey first. I really liked it, so I got one too. Okay, he wanted me to tell you that. So there you go, Nolan. <laughs> but anyway, it proves my point that it runs in the family. The only reason I'm a San Francisco Giants fan is because my dad was a New York Giants fan. And then when the New York Giants moved to San Francisco, he followed them to San Francisco and, of course, became a San Francisco Giants fan. So it kind of runs in the family. 
My son Nolan, my son Isaac are San Francisco Giants fans. My son Phoenix has not been trained yet. He got an angel's hat, but he will be beaten later for purchasing that hat. Okay. He will soon be a Giants fan. My point, I wear this jersey because it's in the family. I'm a fan of the Giants because it was in the family. Friends, when we're in a relationship with Jesus, we're in the family. And he wants us in the game doing the stuff. Amen? And it doesn't matter what you've done, what you said. It doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter how many drugs you've taken. He's saying, change, clean up. You're in Christ. Stop striving and trying to do it on your own. Rely on the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And you will be a people that transforms the tri-state area. That's so good, isn't it? Amen. All right. So we're going to close this morning. And we're going to close our series by taking communion. Okay. So if you got an element on the way in, could you please pull it out? If you didn't get an element yet, could you slip your hand up? I don't see my people here. Where are my, where's my staff? My staff is letting me down. Staff, staff. Could someone get on the walkie-talkie and get my staff here to give those people that didn't receive elements the elements? Thank you. Jeez. Anybody looking for a job? I mean, (laughs) I got a few to fire, you know. (laughs) Jeez. Now, within our culture, that would happen, but I wouldn't do that. I love my staff too much. There's a hand there, Rudy. There's a hand here. There's a hand there. Here they come. Here they come. Here we go. There we go. There's a hand back there. Len needs one. Len really needs forgiven, Rudy. Make sure you get him one. There we go. Everybody got one? Oh. Amy needs one. There we go. Okay. Oh, oh, Amy. Right there. Amy. Amy. There we go. Okay, we got it. Okay. So before we take it, listen. This is what Jesus tells us to do this often. As a community of faith, we do this once a month. Okay, because we believe in sharing communion together as a family. Okay, this is the bread represents Jesus' broken body. The, the juice represents Jesus' shed blood for our sins. Okay, that, that we're to do it remembering who we are in Christ. Does that make sense? Like when we take this, we remember, oh, that's right, I'm in Christ. I'm adopted, I'm forgiven, I'm a conqueror, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ, in Christ. That's what this is a reminder of. So before we take it, let's all go to that place where we hear from God. No one looking around, Holy Spirit come. So if you're here this morning and you're searching for more, you're here this morning and, and, and you've walked away from God and you need to come back. He's calling you home, or you need to start this journey with Jesus for the first time. Before we take this communion together, I just want to pray with you. Is there anybody like that there? Just slip your hand up. Yep. 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 And we all pray this prayer together. Jesus, I'm broken. I'm full of doubt, shame, regret, anger, sin. Change me. I believe. You're God's son. I believe you died for me. Make me know. Fill me with your spirit. Use me to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome to the family. Amen. Welcome to the family. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. It's all take a bread. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. When you do it, eat it in remembrance of me. Let's eat, church. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup of wine, said, this is my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it often. When you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink, church. And then Jesus says, therefore, that proclaims the mystery of faith. So Jesus, we're thankful for forgiveness. We're thankful that we're a part and adopted into your family. God, overwhelm us with your love today. May these truths just sink in this week as we read this book and we're challenged to grow closer to you. Overwhelm our community of faith to continue to serve, to continue to to drop grace bombs, not as a series, but just as a way of life. May this church just be known as a church of kindness and love and forgiveness and mercy. That your grace would abound in this place, God, and that we would be used by you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, if you gave your life to Jesus this morning, if you could text me, that'd be great. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you're coming back to him, text change me to 97000. I will follow up with you this week. I'll encourage you to get baptized. I will encourage you to take a step of faith like you've never taken before. Now, before we go, the prayer team will be here on my right near our elevator. And there's a sp- specific word given this morning that God wanted to touch someone with a right foot issue, particularly nerve damage, and, and, and they're just believing and want to pray that your foot would be healed. If you have any other need, we would love to pray for you, financial, relationship, whatever. Our prayer team will be here on the right to pray for you. If you're joining us online, thank you for welcoming us into your home. We look forward to seeing you next week. Hey friends, thank you for joining us online at the Hub City Vineyard. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our community of faith, simply visit hcv.church. The best way to stay connected with us is to simply subscribe to our channel. I want to encourage you, if God spoke to you today through this talk, share it with all your friends. See you next time you visit us at the Hub City Vineyard.